Stop. Jackson recognized his wife's friend, Becky, whom everyone refers to as Becky. He had gone home from his Saturday golf game feeling sick from Montezuma's vengeance after nearly colliding on the fourth hole. He felt it was better to stay close to a restroom for the rest of the day. Peering through the open sliding patio door screen, he noticed his wife and three of her friends having mimosas by the pool. Diana, his wife, lay on her lounger facing away from the door with Bex to her right, Steph in front of her and Cheryl with a S to her left, reclining on a towel by the pool. Jackson remained hidden so he could listen in without being seen. I'm sorry, Bex, but that's all I think about. I've envisioned it, and I can't quit wondering how it will feel inside me. Do you all talk about doing it? His wife responded. Plus, I'll keep it secret so Jackson doesn't find out. I will not be like Candace. Candace was renowned as the most promiscuous companion, entertaining the ladies with her stories of wild intimacy. He will catch on. They always do. Do you know what happened to me? And Candace is full of it. I've been divorced for three years and regret every idiotic decision I made because of her. She was my demise. Bex replied sadly, and she will be yours too. Jackson overheard his wife say, it will be a one-time thing. I want to know if a well-endowed man is as fantastic as Candace promises. It's not as you think. Cheryl joined in. Cheryl had been married for roughly as long as Jackson and Diana had. Back in college, I met a well-endowed guy. Then I met Bert and knew he could love me more. Aside from that, the well-endowed dude was dull. His life revolved entirely around athletics. Nothing romantic or intriguing. She paused to drink. That was it for him. Steph, who had never been married, warned. I told you when you wanted to join us for girls' night. Avoid falling for any guy you might dance with. They go to clubs, searching for intimacy. Not a dancing companion. And now you've begun something with this guy. You see him whether you want to or not. I'm not seeing him. We simply have drinks, dance, and fun, Di said hesitantly. Until last night, he'd been bragging about his size and asking to sleep with me. I resisted until he showed me. And now I can't quit wanting him. She grinned. Just thinking about it turns me on. Bex leaned closer to Diana with a serious expression. Listen, Candace is not living a dream of incredible intimacy every night. She is lonely, exactly like me. I realize you're on the same route. I would do everything for a guy like Jackson. He's kind. He is successful in business and a wonderful father. Standing up, she tightened her towel. If you let Jackson leave, I will do everything I can to be with him. Di gave her pal an earnest look. I only need to do this once, and that's it. Bex replied with a melancholy expression. It is never just once. I have been there. I understand. Jackson's stomach problems were forgotten as he listened carefully to the discourse. Anger rushed through him. His wife, his partner for nearly two decades, had planned to sleep with a man she met at a club. That is ludicrous. In a fit of rage, he yanked the screen door from its rails and stomped over to the poolside. I felt a firm grip on her arm, bringing her up forcefully. She quickly turned to see her husband's outraged expression, which was evident to all of the women. He grabbed the wedding and engagement rings from her left hand. My rings, she exclaimed. There, you are not my wife anymore, so go be with your lover tonight. His wrath bubbled over as he tossed the rings over the roof and onto the street. Go see your enormous tool boy friend. Trembling with rage, he proceeded, and I heard everything. I knew you weren't faithful during girls' night, but I can't believe you're in a serious relationship with some loser you met at a pub. Di collapsed to the ground in sobbing. Steph was the first to stand, hoping to soothe Jackson. Take it easy, Jax. Di hasn't done anything really bad. That's absurd, he replied. To hell with all of you. You knew what was going to happen when you started taking her out. Especially you, Stephanie. He pointed accusingly at her. Since you're all here, you can assist this woman pack your belongings and leave my house right now. Cheryl gave a deceptive smile. Come on, you do not mean that. She softly placed her palm on his chest, but then stumbled backward into the pool when Jackson shoved her. I'm gone for an hour, and I don't want this woman in my home when I return. Guess what? Stephanie has a new roommate. With that, Jackson stormed back into the home and emerged through the door. I heard you, Bex. I'm excited about our dates, but I won't sleep with you until after the divorce. Are you all right with losing these friendships? Becky straightened up. Absolutely no issue. She grinned. He seemed like a tremendous catch. 
she assumed she had learned from her previous blunders. However, it was too late back then. A week later, Dai's request was fulfilled. Bex noticed Dai meeting her beau at girls' night on Friday. She knew him as one of the shady males that prey on married women at nightclubs. He used to be housemates with the man who had seduced her years before, a decision she regretted dearly. She knew Dai's life would change dramatically tonight, just as her own had. She felt horrible for not doing more to stop Dai, but she knew. Dai made up her mind and it was definitive. Bex regretted not capturing photographs of Dai's behavior sooner. She had been monitoring her friend's actions throughout girls' nights in the hopes that she would not make the same mistake. It appeared that she was taking these photos to grab Dai's spouse for herself. Perhaps she was. She pondered that night. Dai did not dance with her date. Instead, she looked at her friends and told them she'd catch up later. She greeted the man, and they left the club together in his filthy apartment. Dai felt nervous and excited. This was her first experience with a man other than Jackson in almost 20 years. When she approached him, her lover noticed her naked fingertips. Put your ring back on. I want to see them on your hands as you do it. He insisted, Dai explained. I cannot. Jackson took them when he kicked me out last weekend. Why do you do this? Are you cheating on someone else? He questioned. She defended herself. No, he overheard me talking with my friends about wanting you, so he grabbed them and shoved me out. She pondered if Bex was correct when he said he just liked married women for the thrill. Don't you want to be closer? He paused, contemplating her attractiveness. But the fascination faded. Without a husband, she may cling to him. He wasn't interested in that. Here is the deal. I'll give you whatever you desire tonight, my giant Johnson. But then, you've had to go. I do not desire a relationship. I do it with married women because I want to avoid attachments. He wasn't as athletic as Jackson, but it didn't matter to her. She knew what she wanted. After a while, he pulled her aside and directed her to the bed. Without warning, he shoved his tool as far inside as he could. Di gasped in pain. How was it? You loved it. He smirked and went to the bathroom. Di followed, sitting on the toilet and cleaning up. She was disappointed. Regardless of his stature, the event left her dissatisfied. Much like the first time, as she returned to Steph's place, she realized it had only been an hour since she had left the club with him. If she had been with Jackson, they would have cuddled after making love. I'm feeling sad and alone. Di's cheeks welled up with tears as she returned to Steph's deserted apartment via Uber. Jackson spent the week preparing for his new life. Some may call him cold, but that's how he dealt with problems, by compartmentalizing them. With a profitable firm, he could delegate responsibilities and focus on what was important. He did not seek vengeance in the divorce settlement. Despite being together for over two decades, Di changed seeking girl time every week. He grew irritated of her friend's continual presence around the pool while Di was having her big moment. Jackson was two hours away, having dinner with their son at college. He wanted to tell him about his divorce, man to man, anticipating potential future challenges. He realized his youngster might have a different perspective. The following day, Saturday, Jackson returned home after lunch with his son. He hoped the visit had not had an impact on the boy's grades. Meanwhile, Steph questioned Di about her night with her partner. Di, disappointed, stated that hearing Candace and Steph's stories was not what she had expected. She had hoped for extreme closeness, but instead ended up sore. Steph insisted on finding the ideal companion, and she knew exactly who she was looking for. She'd dated two guys who knew each other, and she thought she could set up a double date with them tonight. After dinner and dancing, the two couples went back to Steph's apartment. Steph had a choice between the two men, and her second option was more than happy to accompany Di. They played around on the sofa. She soon became frustrated as he continued his inept attempts. Was this her future? Unsatisfying meetings with men who only wanted their own pleasure? She rolled him off and went into the bathroom to shower, feeling unclean. She had spent two nights with two different men and felt let down by both. As she lathered up in the warm water, she sensed a chilly air and realized someone had joined her in the shower. He grabbed her, and she couldn't push him away because of his size. Desperate, she smashed a soap dish into his skull, causing him to collapse on the floor. She went onto the toilet seat and shouted for Steph, while Diana stood on the seat waiting for help. 
Jackson was fast sleeping on the sofa where he had stayed since kicking her out. He could sleep there, but he couldn't sleep in their bed because he was afraid she would be with other men. He awoke to a knock on the door, wearing only boxers and a t-shirt and feeling sleepy. If he'd looked through the crowd, he might not have opened the door, but he did. Candace stood there, known as the Queen of Promiscuity. Candace's physical appearance was amazing, with a small, wonderful form. She started her own fitness company, focusing in training overweight people. Jackson, on the other hand, always perceived her as having a lovely appearance, but a rotting core. It was past 1 a.m., and she was dressed in a tight black outfit that highlighted her assets. Jackson frowned upon her arrival. What do you want? She flashed a smile, which was typically effective. I figured you would need some company tonight, and I'm here to offer my services. She got hold of it and stroked it while speaking to him. Very excellent, Jax. This will do fine. Jackson firmly removed Candace, shaking his head. Not happening. Go home. She displayed a humorous expression. Come on, I heard you and Di split, so why not have some fun pushing her back? Jackson closed the door hard in Candace's face, disregarding her smile as she walked away. The following morning, Jackson did something he hadn't done in two decades. He washed up and went to church. Despite his Baptist heritage, he chose to attend a nearby non-denominational service. Arriving early, he took a seat toward the rear to avoid disrupting others. The sermon discussed allowing God guide you to become a better person and serve others. Something is stirring inside Jackson. Despite his success, he felt unfulfilled by giving back to others. Perhaps mentoring children could make a difference, he thought. Feeling better, he returned home to find Diana waiting on the front steps. She stood, visibly furious, and began shouting at him, demanding to know where he had been and why she couldn't get inside. He calmly said, I went to church. Instead of messing around, you might want to consider joining a church. I am sure there are lots of men there. After unlocking the door, he entered, followed by Di. She didn't spend time expressing her desire to return home, noting her dissatisfaction with Steph's lifestyle. No, you can't return here. I've released you from your vows, which you were about to break anyhow if you hadn't already. What was your experience with the huge tool? Jackson interrupted Di before she could finish. I did not die. I started. But Jackson cut her off. Do not lie. I know you too well. I can tell you've been with him since your departure. Di remembered Jackson's warning about going to a girl's night with her buddy last year. He had made it plain that cheating will occur sooner or later. She refused to concede he was right. He highlighted that it was inappropriate for married people to act single because it could endanger his business. As Di attempted to hug him, he stopped her tomorrow. I will have Tracy, my new assistant, provide you a list of affordable apartments. You can take the bedroom, furnishings, and everything else you require, Di pleaded, tears spilling down her face. I cannot subsist on my own. You have to help me, Jackson stayed resolute. You did not have to work. I make enough money. But you insisted on a job. You haven't saved anything. You spend your full paycheck right away. That needs to change. As a divorcee, you will have to manage your funds. Many families survive on less than you earn. He walked her to the car. You will be served on Wednesday at work. Unless you'd prefer to attend Abe's office on Tuesday for a more relaxed serving. Di received the papers at work on Wednesday, still hoping Jackson would not proceed with the divorce. She'd been with him for more than two decades and typically got her way. But she was discovering that a Jackson who loves you is distinct from a Jackson who chooses not to love you. Wednesday night, the girls gathered at Cheryl's house to cheer up Di, who had too much drink and little food. Candace arrived with more alcohol, ignorant of the sad atmosphere. I didn't realize this was a party. As they drank, more tongues loosened, and Candace disclosed her intentions to Jackson. The intoxicated females burst out laughing. Cheryl joined in. Bex gets first dibs. Ha! Candace stood up and ran her hands down her body. Does she believe her mommy body can compete with this? She confesses her failed attempt to seduce Jackson, Candace commented. What were your thoughts, Di? Your dude has a fantastic tool. I grabbed it. I recognize quality when I sense it. Maybe I will marry Jax. I would not have to work. I'd be content if I could only keep him happy. She smirked. Or perhaps I will marry him, enjoy him for a while, and then divorce him. You know I can't be faithful. 
Diana was beginning to understand the weight of her actions for the first time. As Di continued to drink, Jackson met Bex and her children at the front door holding a casserole dish. I thought you would need a friend tonight. They dined on the patio discussing Jackson's sentiments after he asked Di to go. Meanwhile, Bex and his children played basketball in the backyard. I'm sure you're aware that the others have joined her to help her cope with being served today. I decided to be here with you instead. Thank you for being there for me. Jackson expressed gratitude. Bex didn't stay long because her children had school the following day. Before leaving, she kissed Jackson gently on the lips. He grinned as they separated, a kiss full of temptation that lasted exactly the appropriate length of time. Around 1.30 a.m., Diana woke Jackson up at 2 a.m. with a drunken call. She alternated between crying and insulting him, questioning his feelings for her. To Jackson, it appeared like Di did not love him enough to resist going to clubs and engaging in who-knows-what behaviors. After her third call, he shut off his phone, planning to call her again tomorrow at 11. Jackson dialed her number, but she made no apologies for last night's inebriated calls. He asked why she hadn't returned Tracy's call regarding the apartment she discovered, but she ignored him. She indicated a desire to return home. No, our marriage is over because you've been with other men. You couldn't wait to be served before looking for another guy. I hope it was worthwhile. For a week, you couldn't stop testing out other males. There was a knock on the door, and Jackson noticed Bex clutching a paper bag. As he ended the call, he signaled for them to wait. You desired other men, so I am providing you the single life you seem to desire. Sign the paperwork. If you do not meet with Tracy tomorrow, I will find an apartment for you. I will pay the first two months' rent. That is it. I've got to go. Bex just brought me lunch. He hung up by 6 p.m. Stephanie was fed up with Di's complaints. Girl, you've got to confront reality. Bex is not taking your man. Let's get real. You desired that guy's larger tool and got it. So what did Jackson get? After 20 years of marriage, he recognized he couldn't provide you all you wanted. Sorry, but no man wants that. The Jackson I know will not accept you back. Di did not want to hear it, but you did not stop me. Steph shot her a look. Why should I? When you desire something, you go after it. That is who you are. Besides, I'm hardly a saint. You botched up. And now you want Jackson to act as if nothing happened. I'm pleased he doesn't know everything you've done. Change to something better. Let us cheer you up. Two weeks had gone, and Di had been disappointed with several new relationships. Bert and Cheryl went with Di to the apartment Jackson had set up for her on Monday evening after work. He decorated it with her favorite master bedroom suite and stuff from their house. The apartment had just been painted and cleaned, and the fridge was fully supplied. Bert, as a kind husband, carried Di's clothes inside as Cheryl instructed. He hung up the clothing that required it and opened the plastic boxes containing folded stuff. Later, he returned with supper, and they all spent the evening together keeping Di company during her first night. There. Cheryl realized Di was trying to prolong the divorce, hoping Jackson would miss her and return her to their ideal life. She stayed quiet about Bex's numerous lunches with Jackson, knowing that it would only make matters worse for Di. Cheryl suggested a housewarming girls' night at Di's new place on Friday. Bex answered Cheryl's call. He says we'll be gathering at Di's new apartment on Friday. Please join us. I haven't seen you for a time. She paused. The children's father has not been able to take them for several months. He's been working out of town, so I haven't had much time to get out. It was a white lie. She paid Jackson infrequent visits, but never stayed for long. She was only checking in on him, knowing he wouldn't cross any bounds. I'll see if I can have someone monitor them on Friday. They're teenagers, Mama Bear. They can cope on their own. Sure, but I might want my security deposit returned someday. They might devastate the place. Jackson adored his meals with Becky. She knew he rarely left the workplace for lunch, always brings his own meals. That determination most certainly helped him succeed. It was small stuff like that. Bex worked about two blocks away from Jackson's establishment. They did not meet every day, but he enjoyed her company. She was Di's sole buddy who he really liked. He put up with the others solely to keep the peace. During their Thursday lunch... Bex requested Jackson to monitor the kids so she could attend Di's housewarming. He agreed without hesitation. Jackson enjoyed spending time with Becky's children. 
Three lads, ages 13, 15, and 16, regarded Jackson as a cool uncle. They played basketball together, which helped to replace the gap created by not playing with his own son. Bex didn't have to send the kids off since Jackson picked them up and drove them to the batting cages and go-kart track, taking a big breath. Bex knocked on the door. Come in, came the response from within. Looking through the doorway, she noticed Cheryl and Steph with lifted glasses. But before she could enter, Candace rushed by, announcing, Hello, ladies. She was already really tipsy. As the toilet flushed, Di filled the room. There was an underlying tension between Bex and Di, which would lessen as the evening progressed and more wine and whiskey shots were consumed. Drunk Cheryl suggested that they all help Di reconcile with Jackson. This pained Bex terribly. She had genuine feelings for Jackson and not simply Jax. Tipsy. Candace jumped in, claiming that Di couldn't win Jackson back unless she slept with him. She reported that when she touched it, it felt exactly perfect in her hands. Not too huge, not too small, just right. Bex chastised Candace for her nasty remarks, but Candace fired back, insulting Bex's alleged attempts to nab Jackson. She argued that Bex, as a single mother, was seeking for a new daddy for her children, and that Jackson, as an empty nester, would not want to raise someone else's children. Bex was aware that her pals may be superficial, as her ex was constantly reminding her. But hearing Candace talk about Jackson in that manner was too much. Before Bex could react, Di grabbed her hair and told her to keep away from Jackson, accusing her of coming from his office during lunch breaks. Di pushes toward the door. Bex finally expressed her thoughts to her friends for the first time. She said that Jackson wasn't Di's anymore. Di had thrown that away by preferring other men over him. Bex emphasized the value of loyalty, pointing out Cheryl's nonchalant attitude toward adultery, despite her husband's adoration for her. I learned the lesson the hard way. You never tried having children because you did not want to change your body. But this is something you will never understand. Steph is so shallow and cruel that she will never find a spouse. No man wants a lady like her or Candace. If every tool you owned could stick out of your body, you'd resemble a porcupine. After a moment of stillness, I've been attempting to give Jackson room by refraining from chasing him. But not anymore. I am going after your husband, Di. Once he's mine, he'll forget all of you. Finding the right husband is difficult, but he will never regret being with me. I guarantee it. She slammed the door and went. Bex drove home and rested in her empty apartment for a time. Her boys were with Jackson, and she did not want to be alone. She chose to call Jackson. He instructed her to come down since they were going to the batting cages soon. He made a joke about his saw, but it was from go-karts. She found Jackson and her children in the batting cage. She sat on the seats outdoors as her elder sons played. Jackson was coaching her youngest. She smiled as she witnessed their friendship. Jackson grinned as he caught her observing emotion and invited her to join them inside without saying anything. He handed her the batting helmet. She initially declined, but her children insisted on standing with the bat on her shoulder. She swung at the pitches, missing every one. Jackson walked behind her and adjusted her position. She sensed his presence close behind her. He led her through the following pitch, and to her astonishment she initiated communication. It wasn't a hit, but neither was it a miss. With Jackson's help she felt safe, and her heart beat with excitement. She never quite hit the baseball right, but it was the most fun she'd had in years, laughing till tears streamed down her cheeks. She knew this night would always hold a particular place in her heart as the time she learned she loved Jackson, and she followed him back to his car and then back to her apartment. Jackson gives a big grin. Despite her assurance that he didn't have to follow them home, he was happy to assist her boys and their stuff into the flat. The next morning, he casually asked if she wanted to go for breakfast together, and she happily accepted. On his way home, Bert texted Jackson telling him that the girls had ended up in the drunk tank after causing traffic problems while clubbing. He thought they needed to learn their lesson and refused to bail them out, especially because Diana was driving under the influence. Their insurance premiums would rise. Over brunch, Jackson and Bex maintained their romantic relationship. Bex described the events of the previous evening at Di's house, including her fight with the females. Jackson chuckled, realizing why she went so early and secretly hoping it was for him. 
It seemed selfish, but everyone wants some attention, and sometimes they want to be direct. Jackson admitted last night that holding you at the batting cages felt natural. Perhaps you felt it too. Bex nodded, confessing that I felt protected and concerned about her flushed cheeks. To be honest, I have had a crush on you for years, but now I believe I am in love with you. I understand you are married, but I will wait for you as long as it takes. She reached into her handbag and pulled out an envelope. I am familiar with my past, and I understand if you have questions. But after you asked Di to leave and I said I'd do everything to be with you, I realized I needed to demonstrate my devotion. The following Monday, I took an STD test to ensure I was clean. I have not been intimate with someone in over a year. He admired her honesty. Becky, I've seen you make mistakes, and I was present during the difficult days preceding your divorce. I've always known you to be a wonderful guy, but I couldn't understand why you continued to go out at night, especially since it resulted to your divorce. She cast a downward glance. Right now, you might not grasp it, and I hope you'll never have to. However, when you are divorced and have children, you do not have the opportunity to go on dates. You still want to feel wanted, even if you understand you are not someone's forever. A lady needs to feel desired, and I wanted to be close. It's that simple. She looked back up and continued, but I learned from it. Being a decent mommy took precedence over hooking up. I reasoned that if I improved myself, I may attract a better type of guy. Why did you allow Diana to accompany you on your night out? He asked, knowing she would be honest. She reached across the table and seized his hands. I attempted to stop her, but once she decides to do something, it happens. Even though I had no intention of leaving with a male, I felt compelled to be present to protect her from making the same mistakes I had. He grinned at her. You're not very good at that job. As they held hands, he spoke sincerely. I believe we have a connection, and when I said I was dating you that day on the patio, I meant it. You've always been the best of friends, and I appreciate our discussions. I look forward to our lunches and calls. You keep me in check when I'm being dumb, and you always make me laugh. Plus, you're a fantastic mom. Bex appeared concerned as she spoke. Since we're being honest, I feel the same way. But look at me. I'm not like the others. I don't go to the gym. They criticize my mom bod. I don't have the money for that. It's tough to feed three teenage boys on my income. Child support barely covers their food expenses. He gently squeezed her hands. You look fantastic with your pretty and curvy figure. I really like curves, he said, grinning mischievously. I can't wait to see more of them. The server brought their bill and grinned as she overheard their conversation. He grabbed the check from the table as they got up. Turning to her, he asked, Do you have any plans for today? Bex leaned into him, giving him a light kiss. Well, there's something I haven't done in a long time. It's been like over a year. In his boxers, Jackson stood in front of his bathroom mirror, feeling nervous. He was about to be close with a woman other than his soon-to-be ex-wife for the first time in over 25 years. After discovering Di's infidelity, he felt insecure, but he found Bex incredibly attractive. His dad would have called her a woman with curves in all the right places. Taking a deep breath, he opened the door. He expected to find her waiting for him on the bed, but she surprised him by being under the covers with them pulled up to her chin. Jackson was slightly disappointed he had wanted to unwrap her as he pulled back the covers and joined Bex in bed. He expressed his desire. You can unwrap me another time, she said softly. This is new for me and I want to feel more comfortable. I don't want you to be disappointed in my body. Jackson reassured her. You could never disappoint me with your body, regardless of how my ex looks. She looks that way for herself, not for me. I've always been turned on by curvy girls. He trailed his hand along her curves from her hips to her plump bottom. Candace was right. It was a good size thick and just the right length, which made her smile. It wasn't like in the movies, but it was above average. For a moment, she thought of Di. Thanks. Di for thinking you could find better than this. That was amazing, she said, a tear forming in her eye. It had been too long since she experienced something like that. Actually, she had never experienced anything quite like that before. Her ex and most of the men she'd been with since the divorce never made an effort to please her as they lay together. Jackson held her close, cherishing the moment he felt like a real man again. 
He hadn't realized how much Diana had affected him until now, but he knew it had left its mark. They drifted off to sleep in each other's arms when Jackson woke up first. He gazed affectionately at Rebecca. His perception of her had shifted. Bex was Diana's friend, but Rebecca was a mature woman he might be falling in love with. He enjoyed her company and cherished spending time with her and her boys. He hadn't realized how much he missed being a father figure. Rebecca, he said for the first time, I'm not sure where this will lead, but I don't want to be with anyone else but you. I don't want to assume you feel the same, but I hope you do. She kissed him back warmly. I love that Rebecca's smile faded when she noticed the time on the alarm clock. No, it's past one. The boys must be worried. Jackson got out of bed and got a glimpse of her body for the first time, and he was pleased. Despite any insecurities she might have had about her weight, he found her perfect. Can I use your shower? Sure thing, he replied briefly, considering joining her in the shower, but realizing that being a responsible mom was a priority. I'd like you to bring the boys back in a couple of hours. I want to make sure they're okay with me dating their mom, he requested. She smiled appreciatively at his thoughtfulness upon Rebecca's return with her sons. Jackson had burgers grilled and a table set with potato salad, beans, and condiments. After they finished eating, Jackson took the boys aside while she cleaned up the table mess. They gathered around the fire pit boys. I want to have a serious talk with you. I care a lot about your mom, and I'd like to start seeing her romantically if that's okay with you. Your opinion is important to me because I've grown fond of all of you as well. Can I date your mom? The three boys exchanged looks not accustomed to being asked such a question. None of them spoke to each other. The younger two glanced at the oldest brother who nodded in agreement, the oldest taking on a sense of responsibility, looked at Jackson. Yes, sir, we'd like that. Jackson rose to his feet and the boys followed suit as he gathered them into a group hug as they hugged. Jackson heard the youngest ask, Are you going to be our new dad? He hugged them tighter. If that's what you want, I'd be honored. Rebecca got emotional as she watched the scene unfold. Her boys needed a positive male influence in their lives just as much as she did. She grabbed a napkin to wipe away her tears as she saw the youngest boy grab a basketball from the shed and head towards the court with Jackson and his brothers for their usual two-on-two -two game. While she was taking out the trash from their meal, Rebecca heard the doorbell ring. Jackson. Someone's at the door. She called out, but he didn't hear her over the sounds of the basketball game. She dried her hands on a kitchen towel and went inside the house to answer the door as she opened the door. She was surprised to find D.E.I. standing there. Rebecca stumbled backward and ended up sitting on the floor when Di pushed her way inside. What are you doing in my house? Di snapped at her. Rebecca got back on her feet and pushed D.E.I. back a step. This isn't your house anymore. It belongs to Jackson. You live in an apartment over on Richard Street, remember? You kicked me out of it last night. Ignoring her, Di brushed past Rebecca, searching for Jackson. Where's my husband? I've been in jail all night. He should have come to bail me out. Rebecca stepped in front of Di, confronting her face to face. Why do you think he would bail you out of jail? He's my husband. It's his job. D.I. insisted. No, it's not his job to bail you out of jail for public intoxication. It's your responsibility to stay out of trouble, Rebecca said. Firmly growing frustrated with her old friend as Di searched through the rooms, Rebecca followed her, determined not to let her get away with whatever she was planning. I know why you're here, but it's not going to work. You pushed him away and I tried to support him so he wouldn't end up like my ex did. Spiraling into darkness, she stood with her hands on her hips, meeting Di's gaze directly. You're in the same spot I was three years ago. You messed up and lost your husband because you did things a married woman shouldn't do. Now you'll face the consequences. Loneliness hits hard, every night. You'll come home to a cold, quiet apartment, missing the sounds of a loving family. I was lucky I had my kids, but your son's grown and your husband's leaving you. It's going to be tough being lonely in 45, spending weeknights at home, waiting for the weekends to find some man, any man to keep you warm. Di stared back at Bex. Rebecca went on, offering some dating advice. Sure, you might find guys with bigger tools, but from what I've seen, 
They're too focused on themselves and their tools to offer anything else to a woman besides act itself. They often struggle to keep jobs or have issues at work because they're chasing other women. They're only good for a quick act. You're attractive, so you'll find plenty of men willing to sleep with you. But those guys at the bar just want to get laid. You won't find a new husband there. Plus, at your age, most of those drunks have trouble getting it up. Steph makes it sound like you've been with dozens of guys in the last month, so I figure it's probably closer to 10 or 12. Since you're here, I bet none of them, including the guy with the big Johnson who started this mess, have been good lovers. Di stayed silent, but her lack of response spoke volumes. Di, I didn't plan for this, but this morning I made love to Jackson, Rebecca confessed. We both know something. We share something. We both know he's an amazing lover, so caring, so passionate. She smiled to herself. That's something really special. I started to cry. I'm so stupid. You're right, he's wonderful, and he's the best lover I've ever had. I forgot that I thought I could have an adventure he'd never find out about and experience something better that once-in-a-lifetime kind of closeness. She paused, her voice dropping. But I already had that, she whispered. Bex walked to the patio door. Jackson's outside with the boys. I can go get them. Di stood next to her friend, watching Jackson make a perfect shot in basketball. He's such a great dad. I forgot how much I enjoyed watching him play, she remarked, glancing at her friend. Do you love him? I do, Bex confessed. Today was our first time together. I'm not sure if he loves me like I do him, but if he chooses me, I'll spend my life making him happy. Menopause is coming and I know it'll change things. But Jackson seems like the type who will understand and work through it with me. Diana teared up. I came here hoping to win him back to be with him. One more time. Even if it's just out of pity. But if he's making love to you, it's over. He's moving on. I know him well enough to see that. Turning towards the door, Di paused. Let him know. I'll get a lawyer and sign the papers. Rebecca informed Jackson about Di's visit and the impending legal proceedings. He helped her and the boys get ready to leave before they drove off. He kissed her gently and closed the car door. Seven months later, Di requested a brief meeting with Jackson and his attorney before their court appearance. Jackson understood Diana needed closure. She apologized for her selfishness and resentment, admitting she'd forgotten how amazing he was. She regretted spending time with the girls, knowing he never approved. Diana, I tried to warn you that married women can't act single. I knew you weren't faithful on girls' nights. People saw you even if you didn't notice. I received pictures and messages over the years, but I ignored them because I loved you. But enough was enough. When I heard you planning to cheat, I knew it was over. If you didn't want me, you could have someone else. But I won't tolerate disrespect anymore. He rose to his feet. Take care, Diana. You'll always have a place in my life. We share a son. So there'll be occasions like birthdays and holidays where we'll cross paths. I'll be polite and friendly. If there's an emergency, I'll be there. But we'll never share a bed again. I've always been faithful to one woman, and that won't change. With that, he closed the door, leaving Diana in tears. Rebecca stood by Jackson near the basketball court. It marked their fifth anniversary, and she needed a moment of calm away from the festivities inside. Jackson's son had quickly bonded with her own boys, and now he was married with a child on the way back home to work with his father. Her eldest had graduated recently and was eager to start his own business. The middle one had pursued plumbing after trade school. Despite the celebration, she felt a pang knowing her youngest was about to leave for college. Nearly 24 years as a mom, and now she faced being an empty nester and a grandmother. Jackson hugged her tightly, understanding the bittersweet moment as her youngest prepared to leave the nest. He smiled warmly at her. Remember? I love you. She picked up the basketball. I won't ever forget dribbling the ball. She glanced at Jackson. Think the boys want to play? He grinned back and they watched as their sons poured out of the patio door, ready to join in. Here is the next story. We should talk. The bombshell dropped on Sunday evening as we were about to go to bed. I shouldn't have been shocked. Really? Maggie, my wife of four years, had been acting strangely all weekend. Despite my inquiries about her well-being, she insisted she was fine, albeit burdened by heavy thoughts. In all honesty, I was dealing with my own set of concerns. 
The aftermath of the Great Recession had thrown both of our careers into disarray, turning our once promising financial situation into a struggle to make ends meet. It wasn't only us. Our peers were experiencing similar difficulties. Maggie, unlike me, appeared especially resistant to accepting our financial downturn, having grown up with less. She'd grown accustomed to the luxuries we used to enjoy, such as our annual vacation. While she never explicitly blamed me, her comments contained hints of blame whenever we discussed our finances. I embraced Maggie and expressed my love for her. Her response was one-sided. Instead, she did something entirely unexpected. She's pouring herself a strong shot of scotch without offering me one. It was clear she had something important, albeit unpleasant, to say, and she was stealing herself to do so. After dinner, we sat in front of the television in silence. I couldn't tell you which shows aired. My mind was absorbed with concern about my wife. We headed upstairs without listening to the news, a routine that usually marked an intimate moment between us. However, tonight was different from the norm. In fact, we had been unable to achieve intimacy for the previous three weeks, a victim of the economic downturn we experienced. As I finished brushing my teeth, she entered the bathroom and dropped a bombshell. Someone from work invited me on an all-inclusive ski trip to Colorado. One person had to cancel, and the tickets are non-refundable. We leave Wednesday morning, and I'll return on Monday. I'm rinsing my mouth. I couldn't help making a comment. Someone from work. That is an interesting way of putting it. I believe the invitation was extended by a man. Maggie appeared to be consumed with guilt. I think you just answered my question. So, who is the man at work? Who sent you an invitation? A married woman on vacation? I try not to lose my temper. You are unfamiliar with him? I thought I knew everyone you worked with. You are. But I do not work directly with him. You've lost me. You mentioned someone at work. No, I mentioned someone from work. That's fine. Let us not resort to Bill Clinton-style semantics. Who invited you on vacation? I met him in the office cafeteria. His office is on the fifth floor, and we've eaten lunch together a few times. I struggle to control my emotions, but my voice echoed throughout the room. How long has this affair been ongoing? Maggie started crying amid her sobs. She objected. I would never betray you. How could you have said something so hurtful? Perhaps because you forgot to mention your lunch dates with another man, or because you've grown so close that he invited you on a ski trip to Colorado with a married woman. And it's been nearly a month since we were intimate. I believe that concludes it. It is not what you think. He is genuinely a nice guy. But his girlfriend has recently broken up with him, and he does not want to waste the prepaid ticket. Everything is already covered, including the hotel and lift tickets. It won't cost me anything. That is so convenient. So what is his name? I made a demand. My voice rose. Joseph. Has Joseph a surname? Brown or Brian? Something along those lines. You've got me so upset that I can't remember, so you're going to fly across the country with a man whose name you don't even remember? You're either having an affair with him or acting extremely foolishly. The argument became more heated and intense. At some point, I wondered who these friends really were. You will be sharing the cabin with Joseph's friends. There are two more couples. There are two other couples. This means you're essentially going as his date. No, as I keep telling you, he does not want to waste the non-refundable ticket, so he has asked a married woman to accompany him. Why are you unable to trust me? Would you believe me if I told you I met a woman in the cafeteria who invited me on vacation? Yes, that's ridiculous. Remember how jealous you were last summer when I was simply explaining the infield fly rule to the woman sitting next to us at Wrigley Field? Are you fighting with her? And the ushers threw us out of the ballpark. That was out of the ordinary. You were ignoring me, and you won't be when you're holed up in a cabin with Joseph and four strangers, I responded. Maggie screamed before storming out of the room. The night went on indefinitely, filled with restless tossing and turning. Eventually, around 2 a.m., we were both exhausted. By 6 o'clock, I was up and brewing coffee. Maggie joined me and sat down before dumping the contents down the sink. I'm going to work, she said. Maggie was known for her stubbornness. When she ducked her heels, admitting fault was out of the question. She was perhaps the most obstinate person I'd ever met on the way to work. I thought about how to save our relationship. Logic would not be sufficient this time. It argued for a more drastic approach. As my grandmother would say, 
I took a chance about a year ago when I hired Nick, a street-smart young man with a criminal record. He frequently expressed gratitude for giving him a second chance. You name it, boss, and I will complete it, he would say. I decided it was time to take advantage of that favor. Nick, I need your assistance. Whatever it is, just keep your word. I presented Nick with my dilemma. You want me to rough him up? Possibly later. But first I need his name and location of work. I gave Nick a picture of my wife and the address to her office building. Every day at noon she goes to the basement cafeteria for lunch. I need you to discreetly take a photo of Joseph after he finishes eating. Follow him upstairs and discover where he works. Please give me the name of his employer. Understandable, boss. When it's time to leave, notify him and obtain the license plate number of his car. You can depend on me, boss. And don't worry, Nick. I'll take care of your time card. I kept checking my watch, convinced that Maggie would meet with her lover to discuss my alleged unreasonableness. The day unfolded like any other Monday, buried beneath piles of work, with time moving at a snail's pace. My phone rang at 110. Hello, boss. I've got the photo. They were in deep conversation, but I couldn't get close enough to eavesdrop. After that, I followed him to the elevator. He didn't notice my presence. I followed him and pretended to look for a room number. He slid into 510. The sign read, Anderson Metallurgy Supplies, LLC. Excellent work, Nick, but you're only halfway there. Don't worry, boss. I will follow him like a ghost. Please send me the picture. As soon as I closed the phone. When I typed Joseph Brown into Google, it filled the entire screen. I was not overly optimistic. I found several matches for the name, but none of them matched the man in the photo. Trying Bryant also yielded no results. I then did a search for Anderson Metallurgy Supplies, LLC. They realized they were a major supplier of powdered metals to the industry. Despite my best efforts, I could not find any employee names or photos. I called the listed number to inquire about Joseph Brown. There is no one with that name here. I apologize. I must have made an error. I was referring to Joseph Bryan. Nobody with that name works here either. Are you sure you've got the right company? I must have phoned improperly. I apologize for the confusion. I stared at the computer screen, wondering how I could find out who that person was. My phone rang again. Hello, boss. I went into the men's room to smoke right after we got off the phone. Who followed me? Bryant Brown. However, none of these names are his real name. Did he notice you? Nah. When he walked into the stall, I was about to line up. I kept an eye on him from the gap between the wall and the door. He urinated but didn't wash his hands. On his way out, a man around my age introduced himself as Mr. Bennett. Bryant didn't say anything, so I waited until the other guy left before asking, Hey, was that Joseph Bryant? He simply shook his head and replied, Nope. That is Lester Bennett. Sounds like a serious piece of work. You can repeat that. He took a cigarette from me and I walked outside. Nick, you would make an excellent spy. Thanks, boss. Unfortunately, I was pulled into a logistics meeting that lasted until closing time, so I couldn't do any more research. That'd have to wait until the morning. I was maneuvering my car into the garage. Nick made a phone call. He stepped out of the elevator a few minutes before three, and I followed him across the parking lot to the subway station. The train was crowded, so I hung out with a group of Spanish-speaking Mexicans at the other end of the car. Bennett seemed cautious of us. He clutched his briefcase tightly as if he thought we'd steal it. He got off at Logan Square and I followed him home. He lives in a basement apartment of a two-story building about a block from the boulevard. The full address is 2366 North Campbell Avenue. The windows are secured with burglar bars, but there are no curtains, so I could see inside. It's quite run down and there's nothing else to do. I waited in the nearby gangway to see if he made any more stops. About ten minutes later, he emerged with a stack of pizza boxes, which he tossed into the trash can. Then he returned with two large trash bags. When he returned inside, I confiscated both bags. This is how my associates typically steal identities. People dispose of a lot of valuable items. Boss, I couldn't find Brian Brown, but I did find a slew of legal documents indicating his name is Lester Bennett. Nick, that's great work. I'm unable to discuss this further at this time. We will have a debriefing tomorrow. I got it, boss. With this newfound knowledge, an idea came to mind. I walked into the house and found Maggie eating a hamburger and fries at the kitchen table. Despite the oversight, it appears that she did not fight for anything for me. I sat opposite her. 
I insist on a few conditions before we can have a rational discussion. Maggie started, but I interrupted her and asked for her patience until I finished speaking. I'm not unaware. I remember how you worded your vacation announcement to imply that you were going with a female colleague. So now is the time for complete transparency. I needed Yosef's last name, address, email address, cell phone number, and work information. I'll also need copies of his plane tickets and the address of the mountain chalet he rented. In the sad event, something might happen to you. I don't want to be unaware of your whereabouts or companions. Avoid exaggeration. Maggie intervened. I paused her once more. I will speak first, followed by you. It always irritated my wife that I wouldn't let her talk over me. I also need the other couple's names and phone numbers. You can now respond. He did not rent out the chalet. It is owned by his uncle. And Joseph does not own the cell phone. What exactly do you mean? Even five-year-olds have cell phones. Practically everybody does. Well, he does not. So if I provide you with all of this, will you stop pressuring me and allow me to relax? Her face shone with a hopeful smile. You've got one day to gather everything. Why don't you admit your jealousy? Because I am going to Colorado. I slammed my fist to the table. I am not envious. I'm infuriated because you never mentioned going skiing anywhere during our entire relationship or the four years we were married. Now, you're set on going skiing in Colorado with a guy you barely know from the cafeteria. You're surprised. I think you're having an affair. I swear I'm not. She shrieked. Please send me the information. If it checks out, we'll talk. I was tempted to tell her that her boyfriend had given her a false name, but I wanted to see Bennett's reaction first. We slept as far apart as the queen-size mattress allowed. Maggie was surprisingly civil the next morning, and we even shared coffee. I arrived early at the office, pacing nervously until Nick appeared. Maggie's departure date is tomorrow. This was my last chance to save my marriage. Nick brought a large cardboard box. He had sifted through the banks, discarding the actual garbage and keeping everything else. Financial documents, bank statements, and certified mail from a law firm. He ripped the envelopes in half hoping it would deter identity theft. Nick explained that he collected and organized anything that appeared to be important. He first handed me a legal-sized envelope addressed to Lester Bennett and sent certified mail. That scumbag is going to court for failing to pay child support. He has two young children and has not contributed in more than a year. A bench warrant was issued for failure to appear for non-payment of child support. Nick went on to say that the police are so busy that they won't even come to your house to pick you up. Instead, they entered your name into the database. If you have any interaction with law enforcement, even if it is for a minor offense, such as a traffic violation, they'll transport you to jail. So I suppose I'll have to plan an encounter with Chicago's finest, I remarked dryly. Nick gave a chuckle. That's a good plan, boss. Overdraft notices and checks with the SF stamp came next in the stack. The bank sent him a barrage of notices before closing his account. Nick reported reserving the juiciest portion for last. Nick handed me a printout of the plane arrangements. It's odd. His ticket is round trip. But your wife's is only one way. That's disturbing, I muttered boss with the record identifier. You can cancel the tickets, Nick proposed. I had another notion. I would separate the lovebirds by moving Bennett's seat assignment to the rear of the plane and purchase the newly vacant one for myself. After studying all the records, I looked into the archives of the Chicago Tribune and identified the rationale behind Bennett's use of a phony name. Shockingly, he was a convicted rapist. Although the incident took place in Denver, Bennett was a Chicago native and all three major newspapers covered the story alongside his mugshot. While the facts were limited due to a plea agreement to spare the victim from trial, it was apparent it was him. He pleaded guilty to a reduced charge of sexual assault and received a 24-month sentence. During his term in prison, his wife filed for divorce, breaking contact with him. A visit to the sex offender register established his residential location and cautioned about his early release after spending just 14 months due to prison overcrowding. Upon release, his first act was to chase down his ex-wife and savagely assault her leaving her bedridden for nearly a month with two felony convictions under his belt. My wife apparently perceived him as a respectable individual. I took my early lunch break and headed to the courts to get a copy of Bennett's divorce decree with photocopying fees totaling to 25 cents each sheet. 
Alongside the divorce filing, I acquired a copy of his rape arrest warrant. It exposed the sickening details of how he drugged and attacked a young woman during a ski trip. Further, I studied do-it-yourself divorce filings at the law library, obtaining a detailed form online. I filled it out, alleging adultery as grounds, and included time-stamped images of Bennett and my wife engaged in intense conversation in the cafeteria for a solid hour equivalent to two lovers deeply involved. My final visit was the Circuit Court of Cook County Domestic Relations Division, where I formally filed my petition for dissolution of marriage. I had three copies prepared, each having the official seal and a stamped case number, telling my supervisor of my need for a few personal days off. He didn't probe further, demonstrating understanding and support. Upon getting home, I discovered Maggie preparing dinner, a true home-cooked meal rather than anything from a packet. It seemed like her effort to brighten my spirits. I embraced her and placed a kiss. The, her response wasn't as enthusiastic as I hoped, Still, any gesture of affection was welcome. Maggie then produced a folded piece of paper from her purse. Here I gathered everything you asked for. Joseph Brown doesn't have a phone, but I managed to gain his email address. He's also active on Facebook. Where does he work? I inquired. He recently got a promotion and hasn't received his new business cards yet, she explained nonchalantly. I glanced at her incredulously, confused by her lack of concern. And weirdly enough, he couldn't recall the name of his employer. Opening my laptop, I headed to Google Maps, inputting the Shirley's address. Strike one. Then I attempted the official Denver zoning map. Strike two. Despite attempting numerous mapping programs, including the assessor's webpage, all produced the same result. The address didn't exist. He must have made an error, perhaps transposed a numeral. Maggie offered one of the tickets. I pressed. He indicated we'll collect them at the airport. No, you obtained the boarding pass at the airport. You should know that from our trip to Maui, I reminded her. I tried the phone numbers provided for the other two couples, but neither connected to a working line. Online searches for their names likewise ended up empty, and I found no sign of them on Facebook. Honey, I hate to break it to you, but none of the information provided by Brown, if that's even his real name, checks out. There's no way I'm allowing you to go Navili. I hope she would realize the questionable nature of Brown's behavior. Instead, before I knew it, my food still sizzling in the frying pan was catapulted across the room, shattering into the wall. Everything was a shame as everything had smelled fantastic. You're not letting me? She shrieked. Who do you think you were to dictate where I can go? Your hubby. Why are you so unreasonable? I'm simply going skiing with a pal, with a man who has betrayed you at every turn. You don't even know where you're headed. He didn't fool me. Maybe he's attempting to shield us from your involvement. Is he scared I'll crash a rendezvous and spoil his seduction? Maggie snapped. Spit flew from her mouth as she shouted. Stop saying that. We're just pals. I'm going skiing. And you can't stop me if you want to go skiing. Fine. I'll take a ski. You with what? Money? We're broke, remember? I have two mayonnaise jars packed with silver coins that I've been saving since my teenage years. I meant to utilize them on a getaway on our fifth anniversary. Now I'll cash them in and the option is yours. We can either utilize the money for a vacation together or for legal bills with a divorce attorney. It's up to you. Stop attempting to intimidate me. I'm not trying to intimidate you. I'm making a solemn promise. And you know, I always keep my promise. I don't understand why you don't believe me. You're a stunning woman. Brown has proven himself to be less than honorable by not honoring your husband's objections to his wife. Going on vacation with him. I previously told you he's just bringing me since the ticket is non-refundable. I'll reimburse him for the ticket. And yet, have enough left for us to go skiing. It's too late. We're leaving tomorrow morning and I have no means to contact him. Maggie, I'm not naive. I will never allow myself to be cuckolded by you. Any man who would allow his wife to do what you're proposing isn't a real man. Think about how you'll explain to your parents, family, and friends why we're getting divorced. Don't give me that. I promised I would return relaxed and make it up to you. Please, I'm begging you. It's not too late to save your marriage. I previously told you I can't cancel. I gave Joseph my word and it's too late for him to find someone else. So you're willing to honor your commitment to a proven liar at the expense of the value made in front of God and all our loved ones. I keep telling you nothing untoward will happen. It doesn't matter if nothing happens. You've made your choice. 
you've prioritized him over our marriage. That night I slept on the couch listening to Maggie's sobbing from the bedroom. My mind fought with contradictory emotions. The reasonable part encouraged me to let her face the consequences and bask in victory when the inevitable occurred, while my heart called for me to be the knight in shining armor and rescue our marriage. I labored through a sleepless night, divided between what I desired. Ultimately, I reached a compromise. Before daybreak, I was already up. Many ignored me. Her irritation clear when I snapped a photo of her with my phone. Why did you do that? She made a demand. So we authorities will have a recent photo in case they need to identify your body. She answered with a stream of profanities as she packed her suitcase in the bedroom. I entered and issued my ultimatum. If you board that plane with him, I won't be here when you return. Our marriage will be gone. She flashed me a contemptuous gaze and retorted, I know you're not that foolish. Funny, I thought the same of you. I believe we were both misinformed. Without kissing her farewell, I fled the house, parking my car a block away. I observed her exit before returning home to shave off my characteristic beard and mustache, dressed in my gloomy black suit, white shirt, and narrow black tie. What my wife often nicknamed my burial dress, an accurate metaphor for the end of our marriage. I completed the appearance with a pair of sunglasses, grabbing my briefcase and a couple of luggage carrying my possessions. I proceeded on my final gamble. Arriving at the gate, I received a call from Nick a few minutes after eight. He was stationed outside Bennett's basement apartment. Boss, you won't believe this. They had a furious debate. Your wife wanted to drive to the airport, but the guy insisted on taking the metro, stating it was cheaper. She even offered to cover parking expenses, but he refused, citing they'd need the money in Colorado. I sneaked a peep into her wallet when she was in the restroom. She had less than dollar one hundred. I hope she didn't plan on using our shared credit cards because I canceled them shortly after purchasing my ticket. I wished I could hear Maggie's thoughts as she struggled with her baggage down the steps into the gloomy underground maze that Chicagoans call the subway. The Blue Line train would certainly be full with commuters headed to work. Nick found it unusual that a man flying to Denver for skiing in December didn't have a decent winter coat or even gloves as they were banged around by the crowd. Maggie's greatly anticipated vacation was already facing difficulty. The journey to the airport took slightly more than 30 minutes. Nick quietly followed them into the terminal, where he noticed Bennett printing out their boarding passes. Bennett, thankfully, did not closely scrutinize the passes, so he missed the last-minute change I made to his seat assignment. Just before I bought my own ticket, Nick called again to say they had arrived at the TSA checkpoint and he couldn't follow them. Thanks for everything. You've been a great help. Maggie's carry-on bag drew the screener's attention, which I acknowledged at the X-ray machine. Please move over here, ma'am, he instructed. Soon, a TSA agent was meticulously inspecting her belongings, eventually discovering the corkscrew I had secretly hidden in the inside zipper pocket. To my relief, nothing remotely provocative was inside her bags when I examined them earlier. The TSA agent reprimanded her and confiscated the corkscrew. My plan would only work if the timing was perfect. I paid for early boarding and got one of the first seats on the plane, a center seat. My wife was assigned to the window seat. I decided to give her another chance by leaving the ILC open, hoping she'd sit beside me so I could present her with my evidence. Luck seemed to be on my side when a well-built young man, most likely a college athlete based on his buzz cut, took the aisle seat just minutes later. As passengers boarded the plane, the rows ahead of us began to fill up. The stragglers frantically searched the overhead bins for a place to style their carry-on bags. A few minutes later... Chaos broke out. Hey, asshole, you're in my seat. Bennett shoved his ticket in my seatmate's face. Maggie had been trying to fit her suitcase into the overhead compartment when she heard the commotion. The man in the aisle seat gave a calm reply. Please check the row number. Your seat is located further back near the restrooms. Bennett went on a profanity-laced tirade, berating the airline for its incompetence. He concluded, move your fat ass to the back of the plane and allow me to sit next to my girlfriend. Maggie did not object when he referred to her as his girlfriend. Instead, she suggested Joseph, who was unwilling. Perhaps you should ask the gentleman in the middle to swap seats without my beard and mustache. She didn't recognize me right away, especially because I was wearing sunglasses. 
By this point, a flight attendant had made her way through the crowd, and the purser emerged from the aft galley to investigate the problem. The flight attendant glared at Bennett and insisted he take his seat so they could finish the boarding process. This flight is completely booked. Please take your assigned seat and we'll see if we can make any changes after takeoff. The flight attendant intervened forcefully. I paid to sit next to my girlfriend, Bennett exclaimed, brandishing his ticket. Maggie realized I had taken the center seat at that point. What are you doing on my airplane? This was orchestrated by you. You are embarrassing me. She blamed me. Her tone was angry and embarrassed. I'm embarrassing you. You are already married. This guy refers to you as his girlfriend. I responded. He only said that to persuade him to change seats. Maggie snapped, her voice filled with venom. She moved to the empty row ahead of me, continuing her outburst. You are a jerk. I knew you were going to ruin my vacation. I despised you. I resent being married to you. I braced myself for her rage, but I was not prepared for what she said next. It felt like a dagger to my heart. My entire world shattered. I'd lost track of her. I grabbed my briefcase and left the plane, prepared to accept the end of it all. Then something unexpected happened. Bennett thrust the ticket in my face and I grabbed it without thinking twice. I demanded with a quivering voice, Tell me what name is on this ticket. I held it out for her to see and her expression changed to one of confusion. Joseph, may I ask who Lester Bennett is? He leans forward, grabbing the ticket and crumpling it in his pocket. Not anyone. He lost his cool. Sir, please take your seats. The purser spoke firmly, growing impatient. Bennett challenged her. His voice was harsh. That is my seat next to my girlfriend. Get him moving. The sight of that jerk claiming my wife as his girlfriend jolted me back into reality. As I met my wife's gaze, tears streamed down my face. Your boyfriend's name is Lester Bennett. He's hiding his real name because the nice guy has an outstanding Harris warrant for failure to pay child support while he's whisking you away on vacation. He's been gathering his own children. I opened my briefcase and handed her the bench warrant. You might like to read this man. He looked at the document, her voice quivering. Joseph, what exactly is this? Is it true? While you're at it, ask your boyfriend why he didn't arrange for your return ticket. I continued, passing her their trip itinerary, which revealed her one-way ticket concern on her face. Maggie confronted Joseph. Why haven't I received a return ticket? Bennett ignored her question and continued to argue with the flight attendant. Will you tell me? He conveniently forgot to mention his two-year prison sentence for brutally assaulting his wife. She spent nearly a month in the hospital. I'm handing her a couple of photos of the woman's battered face as evidence. I proceeded. Joseph, that nice guy did this. Please tell me that this is not true. Maggie was pleading. Bennett remained silent, preoccupied with berating the head, flight attendants, and the airline. You'd better make him move. In any case, he made threats. I did some research on his real name. If you need proof, refer to these newspaper articles. I handed her a few articles each of which featured his mugshot. Maggie, clearly perplexed, admitted, I don't understand. Surely he mentioned that he's a registered sex offender, I exclaimed, breaking the plain silence. Let me jog your memory. He persuaded a local young lady to join him on a ski trip in Colorado. Instead of hitting the slopes, he drugged her and then assaulted her with his buddies. She escaped after a week of captivity, which resulted in him serving four years in prison. She met someone in tears. Please, Joseph, tell me that is not the case. However, Bennett was too preoccupied arguing with the flight attendant to respond. Give Lester a chance. Mr. Lester Bennett. That's his actual name. It appeared to have registered with Bennett, albeit late. I had opposed his plans. He screamed in rage. I'm going to kill you! And he lunged at me. His punch, however, landed squarely on the flight attendant's face instead of me. In the narrow aisle, chaos broke out. My seatmate turned out to be a starting defensive tackle for a Big Ten college. He acted quickly, restraining Bennett until the police handcuffed him. The media hailed him as a hero, and the airline honored him with a first-class seat upgrade. Bennett quickly realized that assaulting a member of the flight crew is a felony. His explanation to the police that he didn't intend to hit the flight attendant but was trying to attack his girlfriend's husband drew little sympathy. I gave McGee every piece of incriminating evidence I had gathered. I swear to God that everything I said is true. Maggie did not say anything as she stared at the pile of documents. It's ended now. Let's head home. 
I spread my arms wide, hoping she'd let me embrace her. Instead of responding, she stood silently. Her head was bowed, fixated on the floor. She did not say a single word. The situation worsened as police escorted Bennett from the plane. He screamed repeatedly, Hello, Stephen. I have slept with your wife. My eyes begged Maggie to refute his claim that it never occurred, but she turned away silently. Maggie and I were informed by an airline security guard that we would be turned over to the Chicago Police Department due to our involvement in the altercation. As we were being led away, I overheard a flight attendant say, Notify the gate agent. Three seats just became available. As we passed, I silently thanked the heavens. The other passengers stared at us, some taking pictures with their cell phones. Maggie now understood the true meaning of humiliation from her walk of shame. She remained silent. She seemed to be still processing what had just happened. I, too, experienced numbness. My knees were about to buckle, and I had to focus hard to keep walking. Despite it all, I managed to keep my head up. I wanted everyone to understand that I had done everything in my power. Everything went according to plan. Almost. I had rescued Maggie. However, my wife is involved in the process. The police escorted us to separate rooms for questioning. Additionally, Homeland Security is present. I spent the next hour going over everything I knew about Bennett with the detective. He directed me to wait. They left me alone with a cup of stale coffee for the next two hours while they phoned their counterparts in Denver. During that time, I paced back and forth feeling like a prisoner confronted with the potential demise of my marriage. Is my wife involved with Bennett, or is he orchestrating this to break us up? Why didn't she deny being involved? My mind was filled with questions that never stopped. Finally, the detective returned with fantastic news. They had received a chilling confirmation from Colorado. Your wife had a strong reaction when she saw the photos they sent her of the chalet, a dilapidated structure tucked away in an auto salvage yard and the horrors that awaited her inside. Bennett had four accomplices, including the infamous two couples who waited at the shack. They had fitted it with restraints and sedatives, intending to render her unconscious upon her arrival. We discovered enough sedatives hidden in his bag to keep a circus elephant unconscious for a week. During interrogation, they revealed their evil plans for their next victim. She is my wife. It was clear that her fate would have been grim. The detective described how the color drained from her face as they revealed their intentions, causing her to faint on the spot. After the detective was done, he asked if I wanted to speak privately with my wife. It wasn't a question, but rather a directive. Yes, sir, I answered. I retrieved the divorce petition from my briefcase after unlocking it. The detective's curiosity compelled him to inquire. What's that? That's what I told Maggie I'd do if she boarded the plane with Bennett. I explained why the detective's tone turned grave. Have you no compassion? Your wife is devastated on the verge of despair. She's reeling from the shock of almost dying. You orchestrated everything to save your marriage. Handing that to her will only crush her. My resolve stood firm. The part of me that had once loved her appeared to have died. Currently, you are her hero. You executed a daring rescue plan. You resemble Liam Neeson in those films. You can't leave her now. I had a breakdown, even after all she's done. If Maggie sincerely apologizes, tear these papers up. I will keep my promise. You can't tell her. I have given you my word. He reassured me and then brought my wife into the room. I took a quick glance at her before she buried her face in her hands. She collapsed into the chair, pale and smelling like vomit. She sobbed uncontrollably. Detective Stern's voice rang through the room. Mrs. Stevens, in my 29 years as a police officer, what you did was one of the most foolish things I've ever seen. If anyone deserved to be a victim, it is you. You should be grateful to God and your husband for every breath you take and every heartbeat you have in your life. As the door clicked, close the door behind you, detective. The room was dead silent, broken only by my wife's ragged sobs. She did not say a single word. There was no gratitude or remorse, just silence. After what felt like an eternity, I was tired of waiting for her to speak. You treated our marriage like it was a ski trip worth less than $1,500. $1,500? That is the value assigned to our dreams. How can I ever trust you again when you can abandon us for something so insignificant? My plea went unheard, as she remained silent. Tears streamed down my cheeks as I waited for her to respond. 
but as the silence persisted, I could not take it any longer. If you had simply said sorry, I would have torn up this paper at any time, but I just can't wait any longer. I handed her a copy of the divorce decree, my heart heavy. Maggie let out a piercing scream as she read it, prompting the detective to rush back into the room to make sure everything was okay. I've already packed my things. Anything I left behind is yours to do with as you wish. I announced that I was handing over my keys to war. It's now her apartment. I walked away without looking back, leaving only the shattered remnants of our marriage. Thank you for listening to today's story. If you enjoyed this article, please like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. If you have a story to share about your or someone else's situation, please do not hesitate to contact me. Please take care.